people began to recognize in the late 70s and the early 80s that they could take the same technology that was used to make computer chips and integrated circuits and they began to look at how they could use this to take um, to make 3D structures. So instead of just using metal on a flat surface, they began to look at how they could free that metal and dig a hole underneath it so that it would be free to move. And, and that metal at the micro scale was quite stiff, even though intuitively you don't think of metal as very stiff. And so that little wire, when it's free to move, could vibrate like a guitar string. And this is the essence of MEMS. It's interesting that we have a big instrument department here. And the MEMS idea didn't come from them. It came from the Navy people. There were two engineers there, uh, Paul Greif and Bert Boxenhorn. And uh, they had this idea that you can build mechanical gyros with semiconductor technology. One of them had read an article in one of the popular science magazines about flies and how they navigate. And the fly has, uh, basically a, it's a hair that vibrates back and forth with uh, nerves attached to it. And like a focal pendulum, it goes in one direction. And if the fly rotates, the hair vibrates in a slightly different orientation and the nerves can sense that. So it's got a gyroscope built in and that enables the fly to come along and go whoop, and land upside down on the ceiling. And, um, so they had read about that and MEMS was kind of a new field back then. They hadn't really, not much had been done with MEMS up to that point other than pressure sensors. And Paul thought, well, if the fly can do that, we ought to be able to do that on a silicon chip. Now, Bert had the idea of making a very small gyroscope out of silicon and he asked his um, colleague Paul Greif who worked in our very large scale integration lab if he could make something that uh, Bert had designed and what Bert had designed was what's called a double gimbal gyroscope that one piece of silicon vibrates is driven to vibrate and when experiencing a rate the other piece of silicon, which is on a different gimbal, um, starts to vibrate, and that is the output. The process that they had come up with for making this, um, what was called the double gimbal gyro, it's really a type of focal pendulum. Um, it was a complicated process, it had a lot of photo steps, and it was inherently unbalanced, which meant that the pendulum was on one side and there was really nothing on the other side. Um, so if, the, if if there was any impact or vibration that would set it to vibrating and you couldn't really tell the difference between that vibration and the vibration you were trying to sense. And I remember seeing in a, a year-end um, IR&D review a very small silicon double gimbal gyroscope which uh, actually couldn't be driven, it was going to be driven capacitively, it couldn't be driven at that time so it was pushed around in a video by a pencil. It was very difficult. At the beginning uh, not only it was not a good instrument, it, it could hardly tell left and right. So when I talked to all those instrument people, and there were good people there, they rightfully so said, yeah, we'll never get it accurate enough uh, to be useful. Uh, but uh, we said, so it's a good idea to continue and see how far they can go. We came up with a different gyroscope called the um, the tuning fork gyroscope made with MEMS technology and that was a lot better. It had fewer photo mass steps. It was all planar. It was inherently balanced and inherently very precise. We figured out the way to build this thing was to, to do it in polysilicon, but Draper being Draper Lab, we get really interested in performance rather than cheap cost. So we wanted to make the device thicker. So we we're going to set out to invent thick polysilicon. And we brought on a fellow named Steve Cho to help us do that. But before we started to make the investment in thick polysilicon, we, say, we said we, we should really verify that the physics works. And Jonathan said, I could build one of these devices in just a month or two out of nickel. We did our first demonstrations um, using actually electroplated nickel to form the uh, gyroscope, just as sort of a quick rapid prototyping technique to uh, make a demonstration. Historically, you know, nickel creeps and metal things shift with time, so they usually don't make good gyros. But he did build the guy in it, and it 
had a low gain because of the, the lossiness of the material, but it, it did work and verified the physics. The intent all along was to use silicon to make the gyroscope. We uh, originally were going to use polysilicon because that's what Berkeley had pioneered. The University of California Berkeley had developed comb drive uh, resonators using polysilicon. And uh, about that time, we hired an engineer from University of Michigan, Steve Cho, and he knew of a process at Michigan using single crystal boron dope silicon to make MEMS resonators. Steve Cho starts inventing thick polysilicon for us. In my usual fine managerial style, after he was here about two or three months, he finally understood what we were asking him to do. And he said, we have this project back at Michigan but I think I can knock this thing off in a month, and we don't have to invest anything in expensive equipment. We can essentially do a lot of this work on a hot plate. I said, okay, Steve, go to it. And he, and he came through, and that was the dissolved wafer process, which to this day is still largely the baseline for the Draper MEMS gyro. So that, that basic design, the, the tuning fork gyro, um, <clears throat> has two masses supported by springs, and they're, they're driven into oscillation like this. And then if there's a, if you try to rotate the chip, there's a Coriolis force that makes the two masses go like that, which we sense with capacitor plates underneath the two masses. And uh, the capacitive sensing is so sensitive that we can pick off picometers of motion. So it's like much smaller than the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. And uh, so because of that extreme sensitivity, it makes a good sensor that we can sense uh, fractions of a degree per hour type, type motion. And uh, it's been widely copied, and uh, most of the gyroscopes, the MEMS gyroscopes on the market are now derived in some way from that. They're either tuning forks or um, use the comb drives for, for actuation. So it really had a, it sort of showed the world that this was possible. We started getting reasonable data out of that as soon as we built one. I think the first guys was, were six microns thick. We could get performance or resolution in the order of a couple thousand degrees an hour. The problem with the instrument was we all knew that they're not going to be very accurate. So the issue was how to find an application. So the third application that people were thinking about was uh, for the automotive industry. So uh, if, if a car starts to slide sideways, if you have a gyro that can measure that and build a control loop around it, you can fix it and avoid the car getting off the road. Rockwell, we knew them because they were in the guidance business at that time. They were building uh, the guidance for the MX missile that the lab designed. Uh, and they have also automotive. They still work well as you know, the, the automotive business. So we created an alliance with them. And we were developing pretty much the mechanical part. And we really needed, you know, small, high-performance electronics and whatnot, which we thought this mating with Rockwell would bring us from the modem group. Draper, even in the gyro and accelerometer space, recognized that a key part of really deploying a system that was useful to the world was integrating that MEMS device with all of the electronics and the memory and the pieces of the system that could say, oh, you're slowing down, maybe you should speed up. And so for a lot of applications, the electronics was just as challenging and needed to be just as small as the MEMS device. But soon as Rockwell signs the contract, they put the job up for bids, and the modem guys say, we're too busy for this. So the only people available in the early 90s was a military group. It was like talking to ourselves. So at this point, Draper started its own effort to learn how to build high-performance small electronics, application-specific integrated circuits, ASICs. Okay, Rockwell eventually got sold to Boeing. Boeing got sold to Honeywell. Honeywell got bought out by Allied Signal but kept the name Honeywell. So Honeywell at that point selected the Draper technology. And it wasn't probably until the, the 2000s when Honeywell actually started to get something that looked like a product. So the technology evolved. Every year we would do a set of new designs. And uh, uh, as the me mechanisms evolved, so the electronics had to evolve also. We got better and better electronics. 
Uh, a lot of people worked on those electronics. Uh, Paul Ward, uh, Eric Hildebrandt, to name two, put a lot of uh, really creative work into designing the electronics and the control loops, getting rid of uh, feed through, and, and uh, a lot of innovations went into the electronics as well as the MEM structures. So the micro-machining technology uh, Draper was doing, in the beginning we were focused on silicon and glass and things that really worked well for making gyros and accelerometers. But as we began to get into the chemical and the biological applications, we worked with a lot more polymers and new materials, even composite materials. Draper made some of the early MEMS microphones. We took a lot of different tactics. We made teeter-totter microphones, we made diaphragms. Uh, we explored different materials. We even made ones that could operate underwater for ultrasound detection. Um, and then Draper also began to look at applications in chemical and biological detection. So back to the guitar string analogy, um, you also know that the fatter guitar string has a bigger, uh, a lower pitch, and a skinnier one has a higher pitch. So to make this into a chemical sensor, you coat it with something that attracts or uh, that absorbs the chemical that you're interested in. So when the chemical that you're interested in absorbs onto the guitar string, it essentially begins to look like a fatter guitar string and the pitch will drop. So this is the basis, the physical basis for making a chemical sensor. Jeff Bornstein came in and he was interested in biotechnology. So he started working on uh, biotech and MEMS uh, he got us started with tissue engineering and microfluidics and uh, attracted a whole host of other people and, and that eventually split off as a separate group. One of the things that was also interesting, when we started gyros and accelerometers, you know, mem-sized devices, people would ask, well, what can you do with these things? You know, we'd kind of wave our arms around and talk about artillery shells and stuff like that. But now you look at the world you know, and these, these devices are in automobiles. Every automobile has several accelerometers, several gyroscopes. <clears throat> They're in all the cell phones in the world. They're in all these Game Boys and whatnot. They put them in computers and all kinds of devices as crash protection. Chances are somebody else would have invented the MEMS gyro sooner or later. Just because, you know, when something becomes of, of that much interest, you know, we were truly fortunate that we got started on these things before people could recognize the potential of MEMS. Thank you.